All right. Hi, everyone. How are you today? Uh, Tom, great. I have to ask, was that intentional to put Brandon right before me when he spoke about the real estate professional um, status? You know, no, it was kind of linked with, <laughs> uh, with, with Brett Swartz kind of on the tax strategy side. But yeah, I mean, it's a perfect segue, right? Yeah. So usually um, I find property management is is what people think is the most unexciting part until they understand the tax incentives of actually managing their properties themselves. Um, So anyways, from that perspective, um, you know, our our key takeaway or um, key lessons we hope you take away from here is, is to get involved with your property management, be able um, to control it to obviously uh, increase uh, your net operating income and um, succeed with your rentals. Um, so just to begin with, I'm, I'm going to share a couple of slides, but would love to let you know um, who I am um, and a little bit more about what I do. Um, so my name is Dana Dunford. Um, I work at Hemlane. We do property management. So we help property man- um, owners set up property management no matter where their rentals are across the nation. And that's through providing local support for them, um, as, like introductions to leasing agents, um, as well as providing them a transparent platform to control their rentals. Yeah, um, again, so, Dana, yeah, I know, go uh, real quick, I'm going to plug you because I, I do believe, um, you know, we had Matt Owens on earlier talking about systems and controls and outsourcing and automation and all that to our, to our personal life and, and businesses. To me, this is one of those instruments that can be used to, to do just that. So that's, that's why I'm, you know, you're on here today. So. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, give you guys just a little bit about, um, understand I'm going to make this interactive. We're going to do kind of two games first a quiz. Um, and then second, um, go over, um, a monopoly game, but just kind of show you the power of managing your property management, um, to basically, um, control the um, outcome of um, how successful you are with your properties. So let's just go ahead and um, test your property management knowledge here and um, go ahead and blow up Tom's chat here with the answers. Um, so the first one is what percentage of rental properties do you think are managed by a third party full service property manager? I'll let you take a couple of seconds here to either choose A, B, C, or D. And Tom, you can tell us who yeah, gets. Did, did the screen change for you all? Maybe it's okay. just me. Um, oh, my sharing's paused. One second. Oh, Let me what? just. Yeah, so. One second. Let me just okay, go cool. like this and do my whole desktop here. Well, we, got one might... that, we got one that showed uh, 30%. So. Oh, okay. Um, can you guys see my screen now? Yep. Great. Um, all right. So someone said 30%. Um, they are, they are pretty close there. So 28% yep. of mm. folks use a, a third-party full-service property manager. That means most owners, landlords, do not use a property manager. And so if you're out there struggling with your property management, um, there are ways to succeed. Um, majority of the market are managing their properties themselves and using alternative solutions to that full service, um, doing it themselves or doing it themselves using a leasing agent, um, repair coordinators, et cetera. And um, that will only continue, um, like Brandon said, with education and knowing um, that this will actually help from a tax perspective. Um, you'll see more people continue to um, move towards saying, how do I get a little bit more involved in my property yeah, management? And, yeah, so go for it. Ask, uh, a few things. Um, so do you know if those, so, I mean, the bulk of the market is doing their own management, which blows my mind, um, unless they had the tools in place to sort of automate it. Are these just people who manage it by, you know, by notepads and Excel sheets? Or are they really, oh my word. You know, you, you go back to what, again, Matt Owens and I were talking about. That is something you got to get out of. You, you can't be spending yeah. hours to save, you know, 40 bucks a month. Yeah, it's a combination of both. I mean, um, there's still, um, from the perspective of the market, because major mass market is still folks who own properties um, personally, and then LLCs and, and C corps are next. And um, from that perspective, um, majority are still pen and paper or just starting to get onto online solutions, which is exciting. Um, but a, a lot of it has to do with, hey, how do you optimize that? I bet if they look at and they add their time in, how long it takes them to do that, I bet they don't have a great cap rate if they put themselves on that property management line and how long they're taking. Um, yeah. I bet I bet from that perspective, um, they're not optimizing their property management as well. No, as I mean, I, I, again, not to keep 
plug in this, but you know, this is how I, I, I am about Hemling, very, very pro and bullish on it. But, um, uh, you know, one traditional property managers that, you know, that you might go to and, and hand off the, the property, they charge markups on labor supplies. They charge fees for tech fees or marketing fees, annual renewal lease fees. I mean, so many fees that when you look at it, um, I did the calculations, they end up making more cash flow per month than you do. So that was my aha moment. I was like, okay, that's not going to work. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And I think um, if you, if you put together the numbers and, and you get educated on the property management, you can do um, pr- really well, right. And, and increase that um, cap rate, um, which, which we'll show you today. Um, so it was so great points there, Tom. Um, we're going to go over this in our monopoly game that we're about to, about to go through. Um, so what is gross rent multiplier? Um, I'm assuming most of you at least have purchased one property, um, but this is kind of back of the math, um, back of the uh, napkin math to figure out, um, what the ROI will be on the property. And Tom, you want to give everyone the answer here? dividing the property price by the annual rental income. And we'll go ahead and go through an example shortly here. And then finally, my last question for you guys, um, this actually has something to do with uh, Brandon, so the CPA side, but you want to remove and replace a few of the rotting bricks on your exterior walls. So not all, but a couple. Is this a repair or a capital expense? This one, I don't know. I'm going to guess A on this one. You are cur- uh, oh, and I that should be an A. Oh, yeah, yeah that should be an A. I flipped it, but it is a repair. You have a trick answer, not trick. I, yeah, it was a, a trick answer there. But anyways, it is um, a repair. So if you're replacing the entire roof, you're replacing the entire appliance or all the bricks there, then that would be considered capital expense. But if you're just doing a couple, it's considered a repair. We actually spoke to our CPA about this as well um, to confirm. And, and it's sort of like floors. If you're just refinishing your floors, you're not redoing the floors, that's um, a repair. Um, so some things for you guys to keep in mind as you go into the property management and understand how much are things gonna affect not only your taxes, but um, also um, uh, your cash flow and um, overall property management, um, what you should be thinking about doing. Um, so today we're gonna do a little bit of monopoly and you can actually learn a lot from it, um, from playing with your kids or um, whoever you typically play with. Um, so we're gonna take two portfolios here. Um, so the top portfolio versus the bottom portfolio, and this is real life and monopoly. So these prices just times them by a thousand. So Example, States Avenue is $140,000 to purchase. Um, and then Virginia Ave, you'll see there, we put one house on it, $100. If you compare these two portfolios, what you will see is portfolio one outperforms portfolio two. The cap rate is at 12% and the um, gross revenue multiplier is at seven. Generally, a lower gross rent, uh, rent multiplier is better. Between like four to 10 it, it is good. Um, but when you look at the purchase price of 860,000, it costs the same to purchase these, including that house on States Ave, including that in there, but you have a much better cap rate and a much better GRM than you do in portfolio too. So how are they doing that? We're going to go through the numbers um, today. So the first is expand your portfolio sensibly. And we saw, we heard this a lot earlier, um, that it's like focus on markets. Don't go and buy one property here, one property here, one property here. Um, start in one market just to, to perfect and, and know what you're doing up front. Um, don't go and buy 10 properties you know, in 10 different states and 10 different locations. But shortly after you do that, you don't wanna put all your eggs into one basket. So as you expand, you wanna look at other markets and this is where the best investments aren't in your backyard. And, and Tom knows this very well. He's traveled, he's been in, I think you were in the Bay Area and now in Texas. That's right. Um, but from that perspective, you know, he doesn't live close to his properties. So how do you set up your operations and property management where you can still get that real estate professional tax status, um, but you don't necessarily have to live close to your properties? And I correlated a lot to the stock market. So if I live in San Diego, and I think someone referenced San Diego earlier today, if I were just to invest in the stocks in my backyard over a five-year period of time, here's the San Diego biotech and pharmaceutical index, okay? If I just did that, this is what my return would be. But if I invested in the S&P 500, which is 
obviously nationwide, um, you'll see that my returns are much better. So that is actually the advantage of once you start getting your property management set up, starting to look at other places to go to optimize your return, which is what we see in portfolio one um, when you look at that monopoly scorecard. So you can see you can live somewhere that looks like Oregon over there, um, close to Washington. Um, that's where you live, but you can have properties in various different places. You don't necessarily have to buy in your backyard. And then avoid losing justifiable income. Um, so this is community chest in Monopoly. Um, I was talking to a real estate investor, they work institutional on Wednesday. And I asked him, I said, what percentage of your rentals do you collect pet rent on? And, you know, this guy had like over a thousand single family homes. And he said, you know, about, about, I think 12% of them. Well, 50% of, of tenants. Um, and, and now that stat fluctuates a little bit depending on where you are, but they own pets. And so he's probably losing out a lot on his pet rent, right? Yeah. By just not following those standards. And I, if you looked at his um, revenue lines and you looked at the pet rent line, you could double that, right? Yeah. By just having standards to make sure that pets are qualified, emotional support animals are qualified through a standard process. These fees are upfront. He could probably increase his cap rate just by doing that. Um, which in, in, um, the monopoly game, um, we did as well. And Tom, you probably have a comment on that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As so well. I, 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 this, I don't know how it's going to sound, but I, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it'll, it'll sound bad, but I love pet fees. Right. Um, and not, so I've seen, you know, property managers or investors charge a one-time fee, but what you have here, which is what I do as well is, uh, I have a recurring revenue stream for pets. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, and it does increase your, your cash flow 10, 20% typically month over month. So um, it's a trick that pretty simple one in your tenants uh, or your leases, 25 to you know, $40 per month per pet is a nice way to have a little boost in uh, revenue. So. Yep, exactly. So what we did in those two portfolios in Monopoly is one of them, we put that pet rent for 50% of the properties. The other we didn't to show how that could affect your cap rate. The other is master the lease renewal process. So these are the folks who are going around the monopoly board, if you remember the little pegs, and they land on your property and need to pay you rent. Um, you also have lease renewals, right, um, every 12 months um, on average. And um, it's really important to, one, like check market rate. So always make sure that you have data to back up whatever you're doing. Um, but on top of that, um, with it, you need to do that because of fair housing and discrimination. If you own a duplex and you give one person an increase and, and the other unit a different increase, you need to back it up with numbers. So make sure you're really checking those market rates, but don't get too greedy. Um, I see a lot of real estate investors say, I'm putting this up to you know above market rate or right there um, on market rate. Um, where, you know, my lease isn't as flexible maybe as someone else's. And then suddenly you have that vacancy cost and that turnover. If you have a great tenant who's paying online, make sure you always do have those rent increases to set the expectation that rent will increase over time. Um, but definitely provide options. Like I always recommend, and it's, it's based on where you live, but provide a month to month or annual. In other words, when you go to your tenant and say, hey, I'm increasing rent by, you know, 2%, they might say, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're increasing rent by 2% during COVID. But if they see a month to month option that's at 5%, they're like, oh, wow, the annual one is a great deal. Let me sign up for that. And then set it for the heart turnover season. And so what I mean by that is, you know, if you're in a single family home, you own single family homes, and it's um, in a school district where that turns over in September, you... Um, tenants don't want to move their uh, children mid um, during the school year. And so it's probably during the summer that you would see the hotter turnover season. So you mm -hmm. want to set the lease term for 18 months or 10 18, months, yeah. whatever it is to get on to that hot turnover season. And that will just help you um, from that perspective, make sure you're maximizing those rental rates. Yeah. And that's a really important piece that I, I, I would really, for all you out there, um, take, take seriously because you don't want to have someone leave, you know, around Thanksgiving. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Then, then you're looking at January for your turnover yeah, exactly. and um, you basically have lost a month and a half of, of rent there. Yep. And collect fees for lease violations. Um, I always love to sit down um, with my tenants and say, just as a heads up, did you read these fees? I do not waive late fees. I, I give you a grace period till the fifth, you have until the first, until you know the fourth to pay but I'm not gonna waive any fees. Um, we're gonna follow the lease exactly how it's written. Make sure you don't go off the lease because the second that you start going off the lease and giving exceptions, then you're basically saying that the lease doesn't hold true, right? <laughs> because we had this agreement, we both signed it, but now suddenly we're making other arrangements. And so everything from you know full rental payments only um, to prevent tenants paying partial rent where you can't post a notice, all the way to just making sure that they know I'm going to follow the lease and be an incredible landlord for you, but I need to make sure that you're doing the same. Um, so yeah. really setting yourself up from that perspective, um, rather than um, that leniency where you're not following the legally binding contract. Yeah, Dana, again, this is a really important part, right? I, I my years ago, I um I had a tenant who, who was so nice, you know, and they they always paid, but they paid kind of these variable times of the month, and I made the mistake of being flexible the first time. And then it just every month thereafter was just flexible income. It's like what you know. It's so it's hard to do if you have a big heart, but you really got to stick to the to the contract and just you know be be firm on those things. So yeah. Yep. And the best way to do it is right up front when you're signing at least. Can you make sure you've seen these terms? Like, do not ask me to waive them because then if they do ask, they're going to say, "Oh, I remember when I moved in. They said don't ask me about this," and they won't. Will make your property management a lot more effortless for you, and then you're still reaping those um, all those tax benefits that Brandon spoke about. Um, and then chance cards. Um, that's where you get fees, right? So manage your expenses. Um, this is one we see a lot, um, especially our repair coordination team sees. So um, make sure you're doing annual maintenance, setting it up on your calendar for certain things like your HVAC system. Um, if your tenant's changing filters, making sure that they know how to change filters. Um, if you need to, it depends on the property um, and what your lease says, but even sending those filters to them to make sure they change them. But making sure you're just doing the $300 maintenance rather than having an eight uh, $1,800 fee for some new system or a really ex expensive bill there. Um, and then with utilities, um, especially if it's a single family home, that should be the tenant's responsibility to set it up. Um, you don't want to manage those fees and then request the reimbursement um, for the water bills and electric bills. One of the ones I see most common questions now is Wi-Fi. Well, just like apartment complexes, should I should I uh, give my tenants free Wi-Fi? No, because then they're going to call you at 2 a.m. when their Wi-Fi goes out and you're going to be talking to Comcast trying to get that set back up. And then if you're in um, duplexes, multifamily, depending on how the metering set up, um, doing some metering right off the bat um, so that you're not having to manage that. Um, but when you can't sub meter, I'm definitely tracking the usage and making sure you're not losing money. I've seen a, a couple of properties come to us where we are, we're looking at the utility bills and it's like, wow, you guys could really reduce uh, or you could really uh, make sure you're not losing so much on expenses if you were actually charging the tenants what the, the usage is and every year readdressing what those fees are. And then during um, turnovers, make sure you're checking for leaks, drips. You know, the biggest one we see is like running toilets and things like that. Um, make sure you're always checking for that um, to make sure that utility bills, whether you're paying for it during the turnover or when the tenant's in the property, that, um, you know, there isn't, um, there isn't any uh, loss just because of leaks and drips in the, um, with the plumbing. Dana, Dana uh, sorry, a few questions yeah. here um, from Daniel yeah. C. How do I track usage without submetering? This is, by the way, so, this is over my head. Yeah, no problem. So um, basically, if you can't submeter the property and so you're getting like one bill for multiple units, um, what you want to do is you're getting the bill and then um, you're going back and um, charging the tenants saying, okay, um, tenant one, um, there's one tenant in the property and it's a one bedroom. You pay one third the cost and there's two tenants in a two bedroom next door and you pay two, thir two thirds the cost, right? And so you're going to get the bill and you can't, you can't just divide it out and say automatically um, this person gets charged this or this unit gets charged this and this other unit gets charged the other amount. 
And so what you actually want to do is track over time in an Excel spreadsheet how much water was actually used and who the tenants were that were there and understand patterns. Usually it's a number of people, which increases water bills or electrical bills, not always the square footage of the property. Sometimes it's, you can see patterns based on square footage um, of like just bigger ones that tend to have more um, water use, usage. And then basically in your lease contracts, you would write, you know, tenants are responsible for utilities. We'll charge them back for it. And then if it's over a certain amount, we will charge you more, but this is the standard fee. Just to make sure you yourself are not, say you set yourself up and say every month, I'm gonna charge the tenants $100 for water. And then suddenly you're finding that the water bills are 150 and you're taking that loss because it's not in your um, contract. That is super important. And so there's some properties where it's much more difficult to do the submetering to be able to say, you know, unit one has this water bill, unit two has this water bill. Sometimes it's more difficult to do that. And so when that happens, you want to make sure you have all this data backed up to understand the patterns to make sure you aren't losing any money based on someone always running water or always running their HVAC and suddenly your bills get super expensive. And it's usually when we take over properties that can't be submetered where we start seeing, wow, whoever the landlord was before um, the new person took over was really losing out because they were charging too little for the utilities. Does that make sense? Yep. Awesome. Um, and then one other one, I think this is an interesting one. Yeah. Um, from John P. So he has trouble, um, well, he, he's been, it's been a recommendation by his PM to have the, um, have the tenant handle the, the air filter um, and obviously there is some risk in that if they buy the wrong one or they put it in backwards or whatever it may be. So, um, he apparently is in San Diego, so not a cheap market. If that is a big mistake. Um, yeah. from my experience, uh, well, again, with, with Hemlane, you can kind of direct who you want to go do that. I would gladly pay someone 150 bucks, uh, plus the cost of a filter go, to go do it. If you are you know, worried that the tenant can't handle that. Yeah, I mean, the other thing is um, agents and inspections, like hopefully you're doing um, annual inspections as well. It's yeah. very easy for you to tell your leasing agent, hey, just as a heads up, I got a filter from Amazon sent to the property. Can you make sure they know how to install this correctly? And let's take a video of it so that we can share that with all future tenants of how to do it. Um, so I think that's also another way to do it. If you don't want to be spending $150, but you want, you know, to pay less than $10 for the filter and then make sure the tenants um, install it correct properly. That's another way to do it as well. Because you're right, most tenants, when you say um, um, change your filter, they have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, and so uh, from that perspective, you definitely want to make sure they do it correctly. Um, and then this is another one that comes up, unlicensed work. Um, if you've used unlicensed work, so this is the portfolio two um, that we'll talk about when we look at those cap rates again um, and uh, GRMs, uh, what we will find is that if you've used unlicensed work and we're sending out a licensed person, it becomes so much more expensive because they're cleaning up the work from the um, uh, first uh, contractor who was unlicensed, who did something improperly. And then you're also obviously paying for this fix. So you're paying double um, and it, it gets more expensive in the end. So just make sure you have really qualified service professionals. We can't emphasize that enough, like really qualify these people. When you go into a market, understand who are the top um, HVAC professionals, who are the top plumbers and really make sure they know their stuff. Um, some of the larger companies, um, that are nationwide sometimes have not as great quality because they're sending out folks who are just the kind of the apprentices going in there. Um, and other times like, or, um, or most often than not, we find that kind of those, um, service professionals where it's, you know, a mom and pop, they have maybe five to seven people on their team. It's still the people who own the, um, electrical shop or um, HVAC company that are still going on site to help do the work. A lot of those um, licensed contractors we find to be the best. So just making sure you're really getting the right people there. Um, Tom made a point on upcharges for um, vendors. Um, that's with property management. Um, some traditional managers do that. But the other thing to ask is with your um, licensed professionals you're working with, do they upcharge on um, the uh, 
uh, materials? If so, by how much do they provide a breakdown of parts versus labor? All of that stuff you want to know to make sure you're getting um, a good fair price, but also for very um, qualified work. Yeah. And, 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 and real quick, we have a yeah. question. Um, how do we basically get inspections on out-of-state properties by using Hemlane? And I, from my own experience, what I have done, and I don't know Dana, what, what you all tell people to do, but I, I basically have a, a, like a local agent that I consistently use when I have to, to get new tenants. I'll have that person along with a handyman do a walkthrough once every, you know, nine, 12 months, uh, just to find all the small leaks, the loose handles, whatever it is, the filters. Um, and then I get like a, a checklist or a punch list as, as it's called to complete every year. Yeah. And that ranges between 300 to 600 bucks for the whole punch list. So, uh, and by the way, your tenants love you for it. So. Yep, exactly. And it makes it easier to go in on an inspection because when you bring the agent to make sure, you know, hey, everything's verified on the, the list and, you know, the, the tenant knows I'm, I'm going there, coupled with a handyman, suddenly it's less threatening to a tenant because they're like, oh, they're here to fix things where the door handle is about to fall off or whatever it may be. They're here for that checklist rather than, oh, they're here to check up on me and they think I'm doing something bad and I'm not. Um, it makes it actually a much um, the tenants are much more welcoming of you coming in yeah, for those 100%. annual or semi-annual inspections. Yeah. And then build a, a flexible management solution. So that's what we do, but, um, it depends on what you want. Um, there's no one size that fits all. Um, some people say, Hey, I've got a property down the street. I just need software. I just need leasing tools and management tools. Other folks say I'm out of state. I need someone physically there. I like I need a local leasing agent. Um, we have owners who use Hemlane who say, you know, I do repairs myself. I'm a general contractor. I'm going to do all my own repairs. We have other folks who, if you ask them um, how to flip a breaker, the owner would have no idea how to do that. They're a finance person and they, they definitely need repair coordinators to do that troubleshooting. Uh, so just a, very quickly, a little bit about what we do. Um, we have uh, leasing tools to help you find and um, place tenants. So we advertise to the top 30 listing websites, um, pre-qualify book um, showings with them. We have an online application and background and credit check. Um, you can connect with local agents. Um, so no matter where your properties are, we work with third-party brokerages who have a leasing agents to help you find and place tenants. A lot of them also do the annual inspections. You know, some are qualified for Section 8, some are not. It depends on the location in the properties, uh, but we are nationwide. And any MSA over 100,000, we will definitely have an agent there. And then on the management side, rent goes directly to you, including any late fees. So all of that goes to you. You have document storage, you can communicate with your tenants, and then we report income and expense. And then finally, 24 seven repair coordination. So the repair coordinators are actually phenomenal in the sense they know more about repair coordination than anyone else. They can troubleshoot your requests. They know what your thresholds are. So they're gonna call you if it's over that. They can figure out and sense when they're talking to service professionals of like what is actually wrong and tenants, um, you know, hey, actually, you know, I don't think what you're saying is correct. Let's dig deeper into this to really make sure that you're getting that um, level of prof professionalism that you deserve. Um, and so if we go Real back quick, to Dana, the portfolio. Um, question comes in. Yeah. Uh, do you help with commercial yeah. properties? Uh, and I, we guessing, do. Well, let's obviously um, talk about multifamily commercial. Answer is yes. I know that one, but I guess more on the retail commercial commercial space. You know, trip, yeah, trip stuff. we weren't built for retail. Um, so multifamily, absolutely. For retail, we weren't built for it. And so usually you can use our management tools like online rent collection, submission of repair and maintenance requests. Um, but as far as like our leasing tools, um, they're really built for residential. And then repair coordination, we can help with that, but we don't have commercial contractors, which is super important to note. Because we don't have commercial contractors, you probably want to be on the package where you bring in your own contractor list, um, just because that's a that's a totally different, like the HVAC systems in a retail building are going to be a lot different than residential. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'll open it up to questions here, but if we go back to that monopoly game and look at the portfolio, the things you'll see that portfolio one did really well to get to that 12% cap rate, even though the purchase price was the same, was they were actually charging those late fees and the pet rent on the portfolio. Their property management, they were using a platform and getting that real estate um, professional tax status. And then on the maintenance side, they were consistent with it. They didn't have any 
extraneous costs on the maintenance and repair side because they weren't doing things correctly. They were making sure to check um, HVAC filters, um, service their machines, et cetera, um, and making sure that when requests came in that they were on top of them so problems didn't persist and get larger. And then on portfolio two here, you'll see they had um, higher fees, but without the late fees and the pet rent, their maintenance and repair was much more sporadic and utilities, they were sometimes getting charged that because they weren't actually looking at the actual bills and their cap rate was much lower and their GRM was much higher. So with that, I will stop and let people ask some questions yeah, here. So one that, you, I mean, I assume you always get this one, but um, nationwide in the United States, is there any location that you don't operate in? Um, so it's as locations wise, we will be very transparent if you're in a small town. So usually if the population is under a hundred thousand, we actually flag it at least for the complete package where we provide leasing agents and, um, uh, service professionals, we will flag it and do research and follow up with you manually to see, Hey, do we have service professional network there? And do we have a qualified leasing agents there? Cause sometimes someone will come to us with a town that's like 5,000 people in the middle of nowhere and say, Hey, can we use Hemlane? And we say, even if we reached out to leasing agents, we're probably not going to get someone who meets our standards. Like it's, yeah. it's just not going to happen. And so you can use our software a hundred percent. You can use our software nationwide and in any city, but, um, as far as our network for the complete package, you'd have to be in, um, these cities that are growing tier two, tier three cities, et cetera. Um, and like the suburbs of them will definitely have people. Yeah, there. Again, so there, there are a variety of packages with Hemlane. Um, if you want the whole automated, uh, repair recruit, uh, repair coordination or any of that, that's a, it's a different package. Uh, if you just want the tool itself, that's obviously a cheaper package, but that's nationwide. But I, I will say I, had a, I have a property in Muncie, Indiana, which is an hour outside of Indiana. Um, not a big population. And I used someone there for the whole smart package. And that, you, you all did find me the agent, the people that I, I needed. And so it worked there. Yeah. And, you know, it, it can work. We flag it. And then we would, Tom, have manually followed up with you if we yeah. couldn't, if there wasn't someone qualified um, in that city, um, we would have definitely been really transparent about that. And it's both on leasing agents, but also service professionals. Like the smaller the town is, the more difficult it is to find people who meet our criteria and have the reviews yeah. Um, yeah. from that perspective. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Then um, a follow-up is, do the contractors who do your repairs take before and after photos? Um, you could probably request that. Um, I definitely get before photos. I think I get both before and after. So you can ask for it. Um, and then if you do, we will remind the contractors to do it. Occasionally you'll have like, especially at a larger shop, that's like, you know, four to five, um, folks, it's a, it's a, a plumbing company where essentially you have an admin and then the technician going on site, the admin will say that to the tech technician, but they might forget to take the photos. Um, and so we are reliant on that, but we will remind them, please take before and after photos. If that's something you request. Um, what's more important to us is two things. One, they call when they're on site so that we are troubleshooting with them. We're understanding what's happening. If we need to get on a video call with them, we can like all of that to really understand what's happening. Um, and then after that, the follow-up reviews from both the tenant and you, not only how did our repair coordination, how, how did that perform, but, um, and how would you rank us, but also how was the service professional? Because in some cases they'll say, yeah, the repair coordination was fantastic, but the service professional, they were 10 minutes late. They showed up very frazzled. It's like, okay, we yeah. want to know that kind of stuff. Or, hey, I thought their bill was a little bit um, too high. I mean, yeah. we want to know that stuff because we'll look into it as well. More questions for you. Um, yeah, so where can I find a list of all the cities that you offer the full package? And again, I think the rule of thumb is anything over or at 100,000 people in population or more not a problem. But again, you'll find it, smaller cities can work. You just have to do some research to see what, what it's, what's out there. Uh, and there is, I, I mean, there's, there's no list. It's more than just the rule of thumb. Or you can just search it. So if you go to Hemling and go to locations at the top, oh, you nice. can go ahead and search um, yeah. for your location and it pops up or we'll say it, it won't pop up and we'll say here are the cities nearby that we service or the closest cities oh, um, cool. to Thank there. You. And then, yeah, if you are in a smaller city and you are an out-of-state investor remote and you're saying, hey, I do want to manage my properties, but I need someone physically there, 
you can also build up that team yourself. So you can bring in your own leasing agent and we'll train them on the system and put them on your account for free. And then um, you can get your own service professionals there. It's just more of a concern, the smaller the city, the more difficult it is to get really verified qualified service professionals because the competition isn't as high for them. Yeah. Uh, One from John, do agents charge a ridiculous lease up fee to find someone? Um, Yeah. So, uh, well, charge charge a ridiculous fee. So let me, let me give my example. So I, for me, if it's under, you know, if, well, typically it's, it's first month rent, which is very standard and and that's, that's it. That's all I would ever pay. Um, for me personally, if it's under a thousand, I just have them manage the whole process, which is getting the keys, do the showings, do the vetting, everything else, not a problem. Um, I had a recent property in Austin. The rents were like 1750. That was enough for me to be like, you know, it's probably worth a few hours of my time. So I managed that one. Um, and by the way, the, the package allows you to do your own marketing. Um, it's pretty straightforward. So, um, your choice. So, um, please talk about the process to I assume, yeah, make ready process or, um, the turn process. Oh yeah. Go ahead. Oh, Awesome. So um, from the turnover perspective, we found you can't do that remotely. So our repair coordination team cannot do that because you physically need someone on site to verify the work. And so all of the leasing agents we work with, we qualify them for turnover coordination. Now, some of them don't do turnover coordination, but the owner doesn't need that. So that's okay. They can just focus on leasing. Otherwise, the person who picks up the keys from the tenant does that move out inspection and says, thanks so much they're going to be responsible to make sure when they hand over the keys to the new tenant that the property is in move-in move in ready condition. And the benefit of that in working with the leasing agent is they're the ones who've built this relationship with the tenant and they want the tenants to give them good reviews, right? They don't want bad reviews on their services. And so they really want to make sure when the tenant's there, they feel like it's home and it truly is move-in ready. Um, so it's, it's the leasing agents who will do that and they'll bundle it as part of their package. Will they do both the turnover and the leasing? Um, we've actually thought about integrating for leasing. Cause you had asked about leasing fees, rently, and these like self, uh, showing lock services where you could go up to the door and swipe it and the credit card would be charged. The driver's license is there. You make sure the person, um, leaves a lot of our users are remote out-of-state investors. And what we don't want them to think is that that solves the leasing problem. Because when you are remote, it's really important to have someone who's close, who can drive by and say, hey, something looks off here. Or, you know, during the showings, oh, this light bulb just burnt out. Let me go ahead and replace it. Um, So it is still really important. um, Like while we are a technology company and very, um, very, you know, tech first, we also realize, hey, this is, this is a people business. And you really do need to make sure there's someone physically there, especially if you're not. Yeah. I mean, I, again, I, I found um, if it's really up to you to, to an extent, right. I, I've negotiated with the agents that have placed the tenants that when property comes due, they're going to help manage the, the turnover process with the handyman and everything else. So I, I think Dana, you're saying it, it can be done. You just have to kind of have those conversations with the people that are placing tenants and everything else. Cause some people won't want to do that and others do they're fine you paying them, whatever it is, 500 bucks to run the whole process on the turn plus the placement. So, you know. Yep, exactly. Yeah. How about maintenance activities, not repairs like HVAC tuning? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's all done through the, um, the coordination process. Um, how long does it take? Okay. So when, well, I guess maybe briefly explain, let's say that there's a leak in the kitchen sink. What's the process uh, to start maintenance request, and then how long would that be solved? Yeah, so it would start with the tenant. You could also do this, but it would be the tenant who would go through the process and submit the request. Um, at first, we do troubleshooting with them, and so they'll receive if they just say hey, there's a leak. We'd say like, where is it? It's the kitchen sink. Okay, how um, how much is it leaking? Can you put a bucket underneath? Like, is this basically an emergency? Can you shut off the valves to stop the water. Um, if it's, um, you're also trying to determine how many sinks there are in the place, or I think actually 
if it's if it's a bathroom like a toilet, there's only one toilet that's non-functioning. That's much more of an emergency than if there's two and you just don't use that one and we send someone out the next day. Um, so from that perspective, it starts with troubleshooting where um, there's both um, our chat service do the troubleshooting initially, and then the repair coordinator getting involved to confirm the troubleshooting and say, do I need to do anything else? Is this out of the ordinary before dispatching? If it's an emergency, someone's going to be on site within four hours. But what we're trying to do is reduce emergencies, because as you know, the repair bills are always at least 2x for someone to come out at 10 p.m or 2 a.m. in the morning. So, you know, if they can put a bucket underneath the uh, sink and, or they've turned off the valves and there's no more leaking, we can send someone out the next day, or two days later, um, based on what works with the tenant schedule. Um, so it starts with that troubleshooting. Then we dispatch the service professionals. Um, we give a, a service professional 24 um, hours to accept before we start um, moving on to the next service professional. If it's your own service professionals, you obviously want to make sure are pretty responsive because if you only have one or two in there and you don't want to use our service professional network, we will definitely follow up with you if we don't hear from those service professionals. Uh, so we're always balancing. It's it's interesting. Repair coordination, I always say, is the most difficult part of Hemlane for like the most difficult position at our company, much more so than engineering. And the reason for that is because you have three people and you're trying to make sure you're keeping everyone satisfied. The tenant just wants someone there now right? They don't care about the cost. They don't care about anything except getting the issue resolved. The owner wants it resolved and wants to keep the tenant happy, but they don't want this outrageous bill. They want someone at the right price. And you have the service professional who says, yeah, I can make that out there, but I really need to know everything to go get a part. Um, and then on top of that, they want to make sure that they're going to get paid um, very quickly, which um, we help with that payment. Um, so anyways, you have three different people you're working with. And so we always make sure to find that middle ground to keep everyone happy. Yep. Awesome stuff. Um, Dana, you know, it's, it's, it's always good to get this, this product in view of these, uh, these investors and people that are, you know, scaling up their own portfolios. I, again, I, I do think it's a, a centerpiece to the overall process that Matt and I talked about earlier. So um, again, for all you listening, this will be a link to, uh, to trial it and take a look at the demo and all that and see what you think. Um, and we'll send that, send that out after the event and go from there. So Dana, thanks for your time. Great. Thanks so much, Tom.